Welcome to one of our two um, full session uh, talks. Today's is by uh, Christian Miller. Uh, he runs the philosophy side of things for the project. Um, and Angela Noble runs the theology part. Uh, there you, go. Um, you know, and, and Mike, uh, her and, and Aranda with me run the psychology part of it. And of course, Christian ran the whole character projects that came before this one. Um, was the director of both of those. And you, you have, all of you pretty much know him, so I'm going to just say a few sentences of, of an introduction um, about him, not what I would normally do. Um, as I mentioned, he did run the, the two grants before this, the three-year character project where we had an RFP, and then the two-year um, character development grant, which was a smaller um, sort of um, a new, new direction. Uh, he's written over 75 papers, and I'm not going to count mine just in case. It doesn't make that number. <laughs> um, he's also written two books uh, with Oxford Press, and now he has his first trade book out, which um, took up, the press on his book took up about two of our 39 pages of our progress papers. We had to list all the different places that have covered that book, because um, so it's had a lot of attention. Um, he's also co-editor or editor of several books, and in, he was awarded in 2009 the Wake Forest University Reed Doyle Prize for Excellence in Teaching. He was also awarded the 2009 Wake Forest University Award for Excellence in Research. I noticed, noticed this was the same year. <laughs> That's never happened at Wake Forest other than for Christian, that the same person won both of those awards in the same year. Uh, and he's also uh, won the 2014 Klusenich Family Omicron Delta Capital Award. And now, and most recently, he was named the A.C. Reed Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest University. So I'm really looking forward to him talking about the exceptionally honest person, a stunningly neglected virtue. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, so I got to start by saying good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay. My summer seminar folks have been well trained. Uh, we've been saying that for the last two weeks. I want to uh, give. Sorry, <laughs> you're great. You're great. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, I should settle down. <laughs> First of all, lots of thank yous. Uh, thank you, Will, for that very generous introduction. Thank you for your exceptional leadership these past three years, leading the Begin Project. It's been a joy working on the project with you and the other team members of the project who are here. Uh, it's been just one of the, the highlights of my career is being part of this uh, exceptionally good project. So thank you for including me in the project. Uh, big shout out to my lovely wife, who's <laughs> shaking her head, but is here, uh, who has t had to take on all kinds of burdens and uh, uh, carry the load in all kinds of ways during the last three years, especially during the last two weeks where uh, I was involved in the seminar and now the conference. So I want to uh, ask everyone to join me and <laughs> give a round of applause to Jesse Lee Miller. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. Um, uh, Thank you to so many other people, too, the philosophy department at Wake Forest, uh, the Templeton Foundations who have funded the work over the years. Thank you for all of you for being here. And I want to talk about honesty. So anyone ha need a handout? We're good? Everyone's got one? Excellent. These are some preliminary thoughts I'm going to try out with you. Um, most of the thoughts in this talk um, I've never shared with anyone yet. So this is just kind of first trial run. I want to get feedback. I want you to help me improve them. I'm going to say some surely false things. Tell me about them now before it's too late, late down the road. Uh, but a little bit of background and setup first. Why honesty? Why am I interested in it? Well, one of the reasons why I'm interested in it is I think it's an extremely interesting virtue to focus on and to, to think about some more. Another reason I think it's an extremely important virtue, uh, both uh, philosophically, theologically, psychologically, or th that's three things, I guess, um, but just in our society in general. Maybe it's the lack of honesty that's really important right now, but something we should be cultivating a lot more. And so I think it's really uh, 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 exceptionally important virtue to pay more attention to. But there's this weird phenomena in the literature, which is that almost no one pays attention to the virtue of honesty, at least in philosophy and to some extent in psychology too. So I'll give you a kind of selective, um, uh, a couple examples, very uh, selective um, survey here. Aristotle himself 
surprisingly, uh, does not talk about the virtue of honesty, at least as I would understand it, most people would think of the virtue of honesty. Whatever he's talking about, it has to do something with being honest in our presentation of ourselves, a very, very, very uh, narrow focus on a kind of honesty, but nothing like what we would normally think of as honesty. In the contemporary philosophical landscape, it's even worse than that. Uh, in terms of monographs on the virtue of honesty, there hasn't been one in 50 years or more. I'm not, I stopped looking after a certain period of time. Edited volumes, almost nothing that I can find. So in the Kevin Tempe and, and Craig Boyle, big, big manuscript that, I mean, uh, edited volume that came out recently on the virtues and vices, doesn't have a chapter on honesty. Mike Austin, one of the core team leaders of this project, has a, an edited volume on virtues, nothing on honesty. Uh, so you just kind of go down the list. Uh, uh, Rebecca DeYoung has a very well-known book on glittering vices, nothing on dishonesty in there. Uh, so it's strikingly absent articles other than Wilson 2018, where that Wilson is that Wilson right over there. Uh, there hasn't been an article, as far as I'm aware, on the virtue of honesty in a mainstream journal in philosophy in the last 50 years. So think about that. Not one article on the virtue of honesty in a mainstream journal in philosophy in the last 50 years. Uh, contrast that, say, with discussions of modesty or other virtues. Um, it's, it's hard to fathom them, really. Psychology is better, but still not great. I'm not a psychologist, so maybe I'm uh, just going to be uh, getting in hot water here. But when you look at something like the Big Five and the f fastest of the Big Five, there's no honesty there. Even the Hexaco, which talks about honesty, humility, that doesn't really look like honesty to me. The four facets of the honesty, humility um, uh, trait don't seem to me to have much to do with honesty. And 100 items uh, on the standard measure. Uh, don't I, I have trouble finding honesty items on those amongst those 100 items? So. Again, this is very selective. I mean, we could talk about the VIA if you want, uh, but um, when I look around the landscape, especially of contemporary philosophy, but also psychology, I don't see much. So we're trying to rectify that. Uh, not just me, but others, I think, are, are now really getting interested in this topic, and there's a collective effort to do more on honesty. Uh, 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 Ryan West and I are editing a volume uh, with a number of new papers. Uh, we've got a kind of project in the works, which I can't talk about much yet, but there's a, there's a project in the works having to do with honesty. And what I'm going to focus on today is a book project that I've been working on for the last y a year or so. And I've made good progress and hope to finish by the end of the summer, uh, a draft at least. And here's the layout of the book project, and then I'll tell you what I'm going to focus on for our time today. So I start off with conceptual work on the honest person. So as a, Everyone should, you should begin with philosophy. Uh, that's the foundational discipline. So that's part one. Uh, then we get to these uh, like derivative disciplines like psychology here, uh, <laughs> ex examining empirical work. That's what I do in part two. Issues about classification and measurement. How do we think about classifying uh, honest and dishonest people and how do we measure them? Uh, looking at some of the psychological research on stealing, lying, and cheating, which is not the same thing as looking at research on honesty and the virtue of honesty, but the, the kind of flip side of it. And then I'll end with some initial thoughts about cultivating honesty. What kind of strategies can we put forward in light of both the conceptual work and the empirical work that goes on in those earlier chapters? So like I said, I'm, I'm moving along in this outline here. Uh, I've got part one and, and part two pretty well developed. And uh, part three is one of the big things left for me this summer. So how about today? Well, um, there's no, uh, I mean, I could do a real quick treatment of all of them, that wouldn't be very satisfying. I thought I'd go deeper into one of the parts, and that's going to be part one. So half the room's probably happy about it, the other half the room is probably dis disappointed about that, and we'll kind of hopefully won't zone out and do other things. But um, I am going to start where we should start, which is the conceptual, and save the empirical for another occasion. So with that said, uh, more specifically, what I hope to do here, if the time allows, start with background for developing an account of honesty and the honest person. When I say honest person, I mean the exceptionally honest person, but I didn't want to say exceptionally honest every single time. So just read that into honest person. I mean, you know, exemplar, paradigm, uh, 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 you know, a high achiever on the dimension of honesty. Quickly sketch a new account. <coughs> then, oops, I should actually point that in that direction. Doesn't help to point in this direction. Um, explore the account with respect to Nazi at the door cases. Always very interesting to talk about. You can't avoid them when you talk about honesty, and then finally develop the account further by looking at the motivational dimensions. So I want to really uh, explore two aspects of a conceptual discussion of honesty. Lots of other aspects that will have to be left to the side. That's the plan. We ready to go? Sound good? Yes. yes. Yeah, wow. <laughs> that was not encouraging, but I guess, <laughs> um, I guess, 
Ah, uh, there I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it. It, it just it makes it so easy, right? It, it just sets you up so well when you talk about honesty. Um, okay, part one: background for developing an account of honesty. And the handout um, has the main ideas. So there'll be a, a variety of accounts and definitions and so forth, and they can go by quickly. So I like to use a handout in case you want to refer back to them or during the Q&A, you want to have the, the wording right in front of you so I don't have to go back through the slides. So feel free to look at the handout or not uh, if it's helpful. Some preliminary dis distinctions. I don't think I really need to spend any time on this for this audience, but my focus is not primarily on actions which we can describe as honest, nor on momentary thoughts which we can describe as honest, I'm focusing on what is referred to by statements like this, Roberts is an honest person. I spent enough time with him to know that he is really dishonest and you don't want to be his friend. Her honesty really stands out in her application. We should definitely hire her. So statements having to do with a person, uh, which um, when we talk about the person that will give uh, the honest person's uh, honesty will give rise to subsequent thoughts and behavior, but I'm focusing in the first instance on what it is to be an honest person. Okay. That's what I say right here. The honest person's virtue of honesty understood as a trait disposition is what I'm primarily interested in. Where um, you can have different accounts of dispositions. I like uh, realist accounts. I think of dispositions as real properties of individuals. I think they're causal. I think they're explanatory. I think they're predictive. I think they're a basis for normative evaluation. I think they're a basis in the case of something like honesty for imitation, admiration, and the like. Uh, but I don't have to commit myself to a lot of really controversial claims about dispositions to do what I want to do today. Hey. So the honest person has a disposition to form thoughts of an honest kind and in many cases to act in a certain honest way when in conditions relevant to honesty. Duh, right? <laughs> yeah, obviously, right? I mean, it's worth saying that uh, it, and pointing out that I'm focusing on the disposition here, but that doesn't really tell you much. After all, I could just swap out honesty with compassion or any other virtue and say pretty much the same thing. It doesn't tell us much about honesty specifically. So I started down this path about two years ago, uh, thinking about honesty. Uh, started with this here, and then I asked myself, well, where are we going to go next? How can we go deeper? What's, what's going to be the stepping stone to a deeper account? And one thing that just j struck me right away, kind of jumped out at me, is that honesty is extremely broad in scope. <laughs> And similarly, dishonesty manifests itself in lots of different ways. And in ways that are, I think, uh, maybe neglected once, but pretty obvious once you point them out. So here's the observation. It's on your handout, too. Look, honesty and dishonesty pertain to all kinds of things, including lying, stealing, cheating, promise breaking, and misleading. And more than that, this is not meant to be an exhaustive account, but these, I think, are the five central ways in which you can fail to be an honest person and you can manifest dishonesty. So I'm not going to read all five of these, um, but lying at least says here, someone who reliably tells unjustifiable lies is not someone we would tend to call honest. So that's one way to fail at being honest, but only one out of five listed here, and there are others, I think, besides this. So take that observation about failing to be honest and invert it into ways of succeeding to be honest, at least in some respect. So we might call these sub-virtues. If you don't like that way of thinking about it, that's OK. Um, you use other ways. So you can be a truthful person. You're doing well with, that, with respect to that aspect of honesty pertaining to telling the truth. So the virtue of being disposed to tell the truth when appropriate for good moral reasons, all right? Being respectful of property, proper obedience, fidelity to promises, and forthrightness. The virtue of being disposed to reliably avoid misleading by giving a sufficient presentation of the facts when appropriate for good moral reasons. So five different kinds of honesty or five different sub-virtues of honesty. I think it's at least conceptually possible to have one of them and not another, so I think they're detachable. Uh, it seems to be necessary to have all five in order to be an honest person. Maybe you have to have others too. Again, I'm not claiming this is exhaustive. So when I see a list like this, I think, yeah, that seems pretty plausible. Otherwise, I wouldn't be putting up here today on the slide. But secondly, I think, well, what unifies them, if anything? Right? I mean, these look, in some sense, pretty disparate, pretty different kinds of things. We're talking about promises, we're talking about property, we're talking about truth-telling. 
is there anything that brings them together or that could be a common feature such that they all fall under the heading of honesty? Right? Makes, that question makes sense? Right. Um, so that's what I've called, as far as I know, I'm the, the only one who's called it or addressed this or talked about this issue, at least in the contemporary literature, it's what I call the unification challenge. What is it exactly that these various virtues have in common, such that they all pertain to the virtue of honesty? Okay. There's another way to put it is like this, visually. Uh, sorry, I didn't come across super clear there, but there are arrows and question marks there with the five sub-virtues and the master virtue or the head virtue, you know, whatever you want, big virtue of honesty. What ties them all together? Now, one answer might be nothing. <laughs> That's an answer we have to put on the table. That's, it might be that only some of them are linked to honesty, but not others. Maybe we need to carve some of them off and shove them under the heading of another virtue. Okay? That's another possibility. But I will at least hold out hope that there's a way to unify all five of these <clears throat> under the heading of honesty and give an account whereby uh, all those are manifestations of honesty. Okay? So that's where my think thinking evolved to about two years ago. Here's a challenge. How are we going to meet it? What kind of account can we put forward to answer that challenge? And then as I've gone on, I've realized that uh, there are other things I want to do with an account of honesty besides that. I've, uh, with the help of Alan and Alan's paper, and also with conversations with Alan, uh, came up with four desiderata that he also has in his paper, uh, 2018 paper, that any account of honesty should meet. First one, let's see what it does with the unification challenge. It'd be great if it could provide a solution to the challenge. It could meet that challenge. Okay? But I want, we want more than that besides just the unification. It's better to avoid counterintuitive results. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously. <laughs> it should provide, or help at least provide, a plausible accounts of the opposites, of uh, dishonesty and the vices here. Um, if there's just one vice, if there are two vices, if there are multiple vices, it should help us along the path of trying to figure out the vices in this area. And that threaten, finally, the virtue status of honesty. It would be really unfortunate if you developed an account of honesty and then f found out, uh-oh, this doesn't look very virtuous. Um, uh, something's gone wrong here. So that would be a, an unfortunate result of your account if it threatened the virtue status of honesty. You might have the trait of honesty, but I'm looking for the virtue here of honesty. Okay, so that's the setup of the background. We good so far? Uh, hopefully it makes sense. Um, haven't put it, I don't think I put anything too controversial on the table yet. That's gonna come very quickly right now. So a new account of uh, the virtue of honesty and the honest person. So this is my first attempt. Uh, so again, I'm, you know, as my thinking was evolving, I had my first attempt that's going to fail, my second attempt that's going to fail, third attempt's going to fail, and so I'm trying to build up and build up and build up, and I'm sure my current attempt is going to fail too, but at least it's better than my first attempt. Here's my first attempt. Um, the honest person has a character trait which essentially and reliably brings it about that the person does not intentionally distort the facts. Okay? Pretty abstract, sorry um, about that. Let me clarify and uh, then give you some ways to unpack it and make it more tangible. Reliably, um, so we've got a character trait here. I'm thinking of it as cross-situationally consistent, okay, <clears throat> across situations relevant to honesty. I'm thinking of it as stable over time in iterations of the same kind of situation. Distort, I don't have any kind of analysis to offer of distort, but I mean something in the ballpark of misrepresents uh, the facts. Intentionally, I'm using that as a contrast to accidentally uh, or unintended. Um, so that's, um, I'm interested in cases of uh, intentionally distorting the facts or not intentionally distorting the facts. Uh, if it happens accidentally, that's not going to imp impugn the honesty of the person. And the facts, what are these? And are they the real facts or the fake facts? Or the Make some jokes there. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, alternative facts. I don't want to talk about that. Um, that's nonsense. Uh, so what I really am thinking about here is the contrast between the way things actually are and your beliefs about the way things actually are. So am I going to focus in the account of honesty on the facts as they actually are, the truth of the matter, um, the states of affairs, whatever you, however you want to understand those facts, versus a person's beliefs about the way things actually are. Okay. So if you're developing an account of honesty, that's a pretty crucial uh, point at the very early stages of uh, which way you're going to go there. And I want to go subjective, because I move like, by examples like this. Flat Earth Society. 
As a member of the Flat Earth Society, which, believe it or not, has quite a few members these days, including some NBA players. Uh, f famously, in the last few months, we learned this. Um, so, Samantha sincerely believes that the Earth is flat. One day, she's asked by a friend about the shape of the Earth, and to keep her own beliefs a secret, Samantha tries to mislead her friend and replies that the Earth is round. She succeeds, and her friend now assumes that Samantha believes the Earth is round. Dishonest? <coughs> yeah, <coughs> right? Um, even though the person is telling the truth, right? And the audience, in this case, the friend, comes to believe something true, at least about the shape of the Earth. Okay, so here is a case where the person is dishonest uh, in virtue of misrepresenting or distorting the facts which she has wrong herself. Okay, so here's a different uh, version of the case. Now, suppose instead that Samantha is forthright. She tells her friend that she believes the earth is flat and has no intention to mislead her friend at all. Dishonest? No. <laughs> Mistaken? Yes, but not dishonest. So, I think uh, there are all kinds of interesting ways in which truth and falsity hook up with honest action. So you can have a true belief and a true assertion. It can lead to an honest action, obviously, right? But you can have a false belief and a false assertion, which can lead to an honest action. You have a false belief and a true assertion, which can lead to a dishonest action. You can have a true belief and a false assertion, which can lead to a dishonest action. So there are all kinds of interesting uh, questions here at the intersection of the facts and our beliefs about the facts. Having said this, I go subjective, so here's my revision. The honest person has a character trait which centrally and reliably brings it about that the person does not intend to distort the facts as she sees them. <coughs> okay, that's H2. Now, is that any good? No, right, this is, this is no good either. It's a little bit better than H1, but it's gonna need a lot more work too. So, before we get to the next iteration, let me uh, pack it a little bit more. So it still might be very abstract, maybe hard to get our minds around what I'm thinking, or maybe I have a hard time getting my mind around what I'm thinking. So here's how it might go in a case of lying. An honest person reliably, seems to me, does not intentionally distort the facts, as she believes them to be, by telling lies about those facts to others, especially if those lies are more than just everyday or white lies. Okay. So I think this works very well in the case of lying. It's a natural uh, extension of or application of the general proposal. So Smith tells his teacher that the dog ate his homework. The teacher believes that. What's going on? Well, Smith is trying to distort the facts with, with respect. Uh, does it worry in, in, in speech is distorting the facts? The teacher has come to believe something that's erroneous. Two things that are erroneous, at least, actually. One, about what happens to the homework. And two, about what Smith believes. <clears throat> so the facts have been distorted in multiple ways here. Again, <clears throat> the, in the teacher's minds, the facts are distorted here <clears throat> about the dog and the homework. And they're also distorted about Smith, because the teacher believes <clears throat> that Smith is telling the truth. <clears throat> and he's not. Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think this is a pretty straightforward application of what I'm talking about. A little bit more complicated in the case of stealing. And here's how it goes. An honest person reliably would not intentionally distort the facts that she believes them to be by stealing property that she believes belongs to another and thereby trying to make it the case that it belongs to her. Okay, subjective, going subjective again. Here's an example where, uh, again, this is a little bit more complicated, but I think it's pretty interesting. Timothy is missing his brand new notebook at school and spies one that looks just like it on top of another student's desk. When no one is looking, he takes a notebook, writes his name on top of it, and starts using it to do his homework. Dishonest? Yeah, right. Unbeknownst to him, this is actually his original notebook that he had absentmindedly left in the wrong place yesterday. <clears throat> doesn't change it. That last sentence doesn't change the fact that he was still being dishonest. <clears throat> Even though, as a matter of fact, it is really his own notebook, um, it's fact, it's the important thing is that he believed it to be someone else's notebook, uh, and thereby in the process, uh, did something that was, counts as theft, uh, and then my account counts as dishonest, too. Okay, so I could keep going, going over all five and say a lot more about those two as, uh, in particular, but I'm not going to. I want to talk about something else. I'll talk about Nazi at the door cases. A um, little bit disappointing, a little bit, uh, not disappointing, depressing. Uh, more than a little bit dis depressing, very depressing kind of cases, but also kind of very famous ones in the literature on honesty. So 
we know how this goes. <coughs> there's, a, there's the Kant version, the axe murder at the door, looking for the, uh, the, his intended victim. You're hiding the intended victim in the basement. You have a question of whether to lie or not to the axe murder. Kant says it's wrong to lie to the axe murder. Uh, there's the contemporary updating of it, the Nazi version, right? So you're hiding a family of Jews in the basement. Here comes the Nazis doing a routine patrol of the neighborhood. They ask, do you know where uh, this particular family of Jews is? And you have a question, and you're presented with an option, lie or not lie, right? So it looks like perhaps there are cases where it's is morally permissible to intentionally distort the facts. Because when I ask Mike's class, what would you do? What does the class say? <clears throat> lie, right? I want to ask him, OK, lies, lie. Okay. Is that permissible or is that obligatory? What do they say? Obligatory, right? So they think not only is it morally permissible, it's actually morally obligatory. Uh, and that's a you know, common reaction in general. Despite the best efforts of some recent authors, on the left-hand side, Paul Griffiths, one of our core t team leaders for the Beacon Project, uh, he wrote a book called Lying, an Augustinian Theology of Duplicity, which holds the strict view that lying is always wrong. And on the right-hand side, another recent book by Chris Tolfson, using different arguments from a natural law perspective, coming to the same conclusion. Now, I'm not going to take a stand myself on that debate. I'm just going to say, let's provisionally accept the claim that's morally permissible to lie to the Nazi. Okay? For the sake of our discussion, let's accept that claim. Probably not too controversial uh, in this audience. Well, what's going on there? It's morally permissible, but uh, if it's intentionally distorting the facts, then it's dishonest. If it's dishonest, it's wrong, but we think it's morally permissible for the sake of discussion. <laughs> Uh-oh. How are we going to make that work? So again, uh, intentionally distorting the facts, to lie to the Nazi at the door, uh, it's going to count as dishonest. If it's dishonest, it's wrong, but we just said it's morally permissible. <clears throat> see, the, see the issue, right? What are we going to do? Well, there are a couple of ways you can go from here. I'll give you two approaches and how my account might uh, fit with each, either of them. I'll weigh in on them. I'll say my, I personally believe. But both are available. So I can be neutral if I want to be, uh, but I won't be. <clears throat> the virtue of honesty does not apply to certain cases of lying, say lying to the Nazi in order to protect a Jewish family. That's one way you could do it. No, you say, look, the scope of honesty uh, is narrower than you might have thought. And in those kind of cases, honesty does not come to, into play. <clears throat> does not bear on lying to the um, Nazi. In fact, if we want to work this out a little bit more, you might argue it's not even a case of lying in the first place. What? You might hold this view. Suppose that in order to count as a lie, it has to be the case that one's intended audience has a right to know the truth. This is a popular position in the history of thinking about honesty and dishonesty. Right? Um, Grotius, for example, holds this view. So in order to count as a lie in the first place, the audience has to have a right to know the truth. Does the Nazi have a right to know the truth? You're supposed to be, supposed to be shaking your head, right? <laughs> right? Does not have that right. So therefore, if you say, oh, uh, yeah, I know where the Jewish family is, they're uh, across town. You're not actually lying. <clears throat> therefore, you're not doing anything dishonest. OK, is that clear? I'm not saying whether you agree with it or not. It's plausible, but is it at least clear what the move is here? So that's one way to go. And if you go that way, we can revise again. We can just accept the whole count and just at the end just add on the clause, uh, so long as it is not morally permissible to do so. <clears throat> okay? And we've fixed the problem. But uh, <clears throat> easy, that's an easy, straightforward revision. This is a pretty straightforward position, but it's so hard to accept, right? For me at least, it's so hard to buy that line. <clears throat> that you're not actually lying to the Nazi. Because it just seems to me intuitively obvious that the person would be telling a genuine lie, intentionally giving a false location to the Nazi at the door. I don't know how many others think that as well, but it's, that just seems to be intuitively obvious that that would be a genuine lie. And it seems intuitive that lying to the Nazi is doing something dishonest of some form or other. If you don't like that example, uh, take another example uh, where um, you've got a sick person who's going to die. Um, or uh, some, well, there's a, th there's a uh, real concern that the person's going to die soon. And then that 
odds of dying might go way up if the person hears that his son has been in a terrible accident. <clears throat> so in that kind of case, it might be morally permissible to withhold or even directly lie about that, that uh, what's happened to the son, <clears throat> potentially distorting the facts, right? But it still seems to me that that would be dishonest. <clears throat> so I'm not uh, I'm, uh, impressed for that reason with this approach. Third, look, I don't see how I can get around uh, the fact that my own theory would say that this is a case of intentionally distorting the facts. If I'm going to be consistent, I've got to say this is a case of intentionally distorting the facts, like, just like other ones too. It would be pretty arbitrary and ad hoc, I think, to draw a line and say this is not one where honesty pertains. But I think plausible, uh, plausibly parallel treatments uh, don't work either with the case of other virtues and vices. So if you think that torturing the terrorist in order to find out where the ticking time bomb is located is all things considered permissible, I still think that would count as a failure of non-malevolence or failure of compassion. Okay. So I don't see how a parallel move with respect to other virtues and vices would work either. So for all those reasons, maybe I didn't even have to spend all that time on it, I think there's a, <clears throat> we should set aside that first approach and go with a better option. Lying in certain cases, such as to the Nazi in order to protect a Jewish family, is still a failure of honesty, but is all things considered morally permissible. <clears throat> okay, That's a different, uh, very different approach. <clears throat> How can we understand that from a virtue type perspective? I guess I think we can just say it's a case involving conflicting virtues. <clears throat> on the one hand, we have the virtue of honesty. On the one, other hand, we have, say, the virtue of compassion. <clears throat> they both pertain to the situation. And, and yet, one is more salient, more important than the other. Compassion outweighs honesty. And all things considered, uh, we should say that the right thing to do is to lie to the Nazi. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, this is a case of conflicting virtues, and honesty gets outweighed, so it's still a case of dishonesty, um, but it's still all things considered morally permissible. So, and then look, no revision is needed to H2. We can stick with the original proposal after all. We're, we're good to go. <sighs> okay, are you with me still? <laughs> Going down this path for a while. I wish we were in the clear. But we're not in the clear yet. Um, this approach might have some costs, too. I'll give you one of them, and then I promise I'll wrap this up and move on to the last topic for today. This is what I call Bloomfield's challenge. Why? Because Paul Bloomfield himself has given me this challenge and given other people a certain challenge with this kind of idea. Look, an essential characteristic of all excellences is that they always yield true prescriptions and lead to correct action. No virtue leads to wrong. Uh, you see where, what's going on? Anticipate how it's going to go from here, right? No virtue leads to wrong. Well, wait a minute. There are some cases where being honest would lead to wrong action. The Nazi at the door is one such case. At least we're provisionally granting that. Hence, honesty is not a moral excellence. Since virtues are excellences, honesty is not a virtue. Wow. <laughs> That's a pretty impressive argument, right? Um, if it works. And does it apply just to honesty, by the way? No, it generalizes to most moral virtues. In fact, his official conclusion is that there are only four virtues that remain after you le level this argument, uh, or you bring out this argument and employ it, uh, the, and those are the cardinal virtues. <clears throat> They're the only ones that remain. You have to radically revise the taxonomy of virtues and shrink it just down to the cardinal virtues. All the rest need to be cast aside as virtues. So uh, I have a response to this and thoughts about this, but I think I'm just going to leave it up for, for fun. Um, it's pretty interesting. We can certainly talk about it in a Q&A or over dinner or afterwards. But uh, there's something to it, right? I mean, certainly do we, don't we want to think that virtues are excellences? <clears throat> it's hard to think of excellences as giving rise to something that's wrong. But we want to say the honesty, you got it, you got it, right? Hmm, how are we going to sort that out? Welcome your thoughts, and I've got some thoughts on that too. <clears throat> Last topic for today, um, looking at the time, I'll maybe cut this a little short to, and I want to switch from Nazi at the door cases to motivation. I think these are just two of the many really fascinating issues that arise with respect to honesty, uh, so I thought I'd um, dive into them in a little bit of detail, leaving aside other ones too. Okay. What about motivation? We've got behavior, 
But like most accounts of virtue, behavior isn't sufficient for virtue. We need to have some kind of mod motivational condition. Here I think it's pretty clear. In the case of honesty, we want to have a motivational condition. As stated, even if you like H2 with respect to behavior, it's compatible with all kinds of crude motiv motives for engaging that behavior or not engaging that behavior. It's compatible with uh, making a good impression on others, not getting in trouble with the police, decreasing one's reward in the afterlife. <sighs> Sorry, I don't think that's how an honest person thinks or feels or is motivated in general. And a second reason for wanting to have a motivational story is that having certain kinds of motives and not others is important for being reliable and not intentionally distorting the facts. So I want to have, secure that reliability too. Okay, so how am I going to go here? Well, we've been talking about objective versus subjective. I could go look at this, just look at the, at the italics. Primarily for what the agent takes to be good or virtuous motivating reasons. Or I could go primarily for good or virtuous motivating reasons. Do I want to go subjective or do I want to go objective? Well, here I want to go objective. Right? I don't want to just open the door to any old motive or any old set of motivating reasons. Whatever the person might you know, bizarrely think is a good reason for not telling uh, the truth or for uh, not stealing or not cheating. Okay, that just opens the floodgates way too wide. So interesting, I'm going objective here and subjective on the facts. There's a kind of asymmetry or at least a, a different way of going there. So what counts as good or virtuous motivating reasons for honest behavior? It's a shame that Julia's not here, Julia Markovitz, uh, who was here two years ago, um, because I would just sit down and have her tell us, because she's the, one of the world's experts on the question of motivating reasons, but um, I'll try and uh, see what I can do. Here's one approach. We can say the good or virtuous reasons for honest behavior are those dictated by the correct moral theory, whatever it is. So the correct ones are the ones that Kant told us. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> The correct ones are the ones that consequentialists tell us. No, no definitely not. Um, uh, you know, correct ones are the ones that divine command theorists or moral pluralists or whatever tell us. This isn't a promising. This is not, not a good way to go. Because if you go this way, that individuals whose motivational profile follows rival views would not be able to count as honest, right? So if it turns out that the Kantian picture, surprise, surprise, much to my surprise, is the correct picture about motivation, then the self-conscious consequentialist, the self-conscious divine command theorist, and so forth, can't count as honest. That's hard to believe, right? That's really uh, being, raising the bar so high, uh, and that's just an implausible way to go. You're, you're, you're narrowing the scope of honest people radically, uh, especially since it's so contentious in the first place, what even counts as the correct uh, moral ethical theory. So here's the second approach. Well, I mentioned Kant. What about Kant then? Good or virtuous reasons for honest behavior take the form of the motive of duty, <clears throat> in this case, uh, with respect to, say, telling the truth or whatnot. So here's an example. I decide to refrain from telling a lie. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. Because it's my duty. Because I have an obligation to do so. Okay? Kant might say something like that. How does that sound? Well, if that's the whole story, that's one thing. If it's not the whole story, that's another. So why do I think it is the right thing to do? We can ask that question, right? So you back me up one level and I say, because it's the right thing to do. And then you ask the follow-up question, why do you think it's the right thing to do? And I say, because it would help me get into the fraternity or the sorority. Or because it would keep me from getting published. Or because it would, I would get rewards in the afterlife. And I say, uh-oh, not honest. Right? So the problematic reasons are creeping in at a more fundamental level here. Problematic with respect to uh, virtue and being an honest person. Okay? So again, it's not enough just to say uh, motive of duty and end the story there. If there are subsidiary reasons, more primary reasons, more fundamental reasons behind the motive of duty, and those aren't of the right kind, not honest. Okay, my preferred approach. Real quickly, I want to do this. I want to exclude all self-interested and motivating reasons. So if you are reliably telling the truth, not cheating, not lying, you're keeping your promises, etc., but it's always or primarily for self-interested motivating reasons, not going to cut it. Okay? Doesn't meet the threshold requirements for the virtue of honesty. 
I want to also exclude dutiful motivation if there is a deeper motivational story which is not morally praiseworthy, which is what we just said in the previous slide. And what I want to put in the place of those ideas is a pluralist approach. Um, so uh, I don't want to just trot out for you a rival simple answer because I don't have one. Maybe you'd have one and you could tell me what it is. I don't have one. I go pluralist at this point. The honest person can exhibit stable and cross-situationally consistent patterns of honest behavior for a variety of admirable reasons of different kinds. <clears throat> okay? Now it's abstract. Let me give you some examples. Why did you tell the truth about your past business failures when it would have been so much easier to lie? One thing you say is, he deserved to hear the truth. That sounds okay to me. I don't lie to my friends. That also sounds okay to me. It's important for us to be able to trust each other. That also sounds okay to me. He would not have been honest. That also sounds okay to me. Now you ask you know, for follow-up questions and they back, back uh, up into uh, self-interested reasons, then that's not okay with me, of course. If it bottoms out here, though, there's no further story to tell, uh, the person has nothing more to say, I don't, I don't lie to my friends, period. That's it. I have no problem with that. That's okay to me. And it would not have been honest. And that's it. That's the end of the story. That's all I have to say. That's okay with me, too. Cheating instead of lying. Why didn't you cheat on the test when you could have got away with it? You, you were foolish. Come on. Why did you do it? That would not have been fair. That sounds fine. I don't want to disrespect Professor Miller. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's what you all should have said. Um, what if everyone were to cheat? That would, have been a that would be a terrible world to live in. <laughs> it would not have been honest, that one's showing up again. These all sound fine to me, too. So uh, we get then different kinds of motivating reasons. Why didn't you break the painful promise? Here's a third illustration. I loved him. That's the story. <laughs> Maybe lurking in the background is a suppressed assumption. If I love someone, or if I love him, it's probably better to put uh, specific to that individual. And part of what it is to love that person is to keep promises I make with that person or with him. <laughs> I think this is, this is perfectly OK. I think it's, we're tracing it back to a loving motive for honesty. But it could go differently. <laughs> Why didn't you break the painful promise? I owed it to him. <laughs> Assumption, if I owe someone something, or if I owe him something, I have to follow through on that, through on that commitment. <clears throat> Rather different kind of reply. But seems okay with me too. <clears throat> Here we have a justice motive for honesty. So then we start having this pluralist picture emerge, where we have loving motives, justice motives, friendship motives, and other kinds too. I don't think this is by any means exhaustive. And I'm just skeptical that this can all be reduced down to one core kind of motivation. <coughs> so I go with this. Now that looks daunting, I'm sorry, and scary maybe. Um, but look at the highlights, uh, the italics. For good or virtuous motivating reasons of one or more kinds, K1 through Kn, <coughs> where those are just different kinds. And we have to list them. We have to maybe uh, work out what they are. I don't know if I can come up with an exhaustive list but I'm not going to shrink it down to just one kind, okay? So, and uh, very, very soon now, um, I have to say something about Alan. Uh, I've already said something about him. I'd say a little bit more about him. In his 2018 paper, this Alan right over here, he says, well, maybe we can shrink it down. Maybe there is just one core kind of motivation in the honest person. And that involves a deep motivation to avoid deception. Well, that's what he initially says, but thankfully, he doesn't stop there. Because it turns out that his real and refined view is this. Honesty is morally virtuous only when the characteristic motivation to avoid deception is grounded in an underlying motivation that is of intrinsic moral value. So I can talk about this. I'm going to go over this quickly in the interest of time. But this actually ends up being quite amenable to my approach as well. I think, at least on the surface reading, he'll tell me. Uh, if not, I'm sure he'll let me know. Uh, at some point very soon. So the only account I know of, in other words, that on the surface tries to shrink honest motivation down to just one kind or one uh, clear uh, proposal is this, but even that gets modified uh, in a way that's amenable to a pluralist approach. So do we get moral praiseworthiness and moral worth out of this view? Not if we're Kantians, but we shouldn't be Kantians about moral worth. 
<clears throat> not if we're egoists, but we shouldn't be egoists about moral worth. Yes, I think if we're Aristotelians, Aristotelians can accept what I've got to offer here. I think yes, on intuitive grounds. This intuitively is going to lead to a picture of moral worth for honest actions. And I'll focus psychological grounds. Not on Julius, so I'm going to skip this because he's not here. Um, but uh, that's not the reason to skip it. Um, but the, Julia Markovitz's proposal, not on her preliminary view, but yes, on her official view. So a thumbs up there too. So at the end of the day, I think we've got a proposal that we can work with, which gives us an account of honest behavior and honest motivation. That fits comfortably with several plausible approaches. Doesn't fit co comfortably with several implausible approaches, but that's a good thing, right? Because they're implausible. So looking to the future, last slide. How would the account work for cases of misleading, cheating, and promise breaking? These are some things on my agenda, research agenda right now. Is it too passive? Um, should an honest person be expected to do more than just refrain from intentionally distorting the facts? How would the account handle Huck Finn style cases? Uh, do I get into trouble there? Uh, it looks like on the surface I might. What does the picture of vice look like here? And does it preclude honesty from counting as a virtue? All great questions. We could talk about it in a uh, preliminary way here, and I'm working on that in the book manuscript. So hopefully uh, at some point you'll actually see a concrete book, maybe a year or two down the road. Um, but right now, I welcome your feedback to make what I'm thinking about much better and save me some trouble that might be coming down the road if uh, I get to say some really implausible things. So thank you very much, and thanks to all these uh, f funding agencies for supporting the work that I've done on this. OK. So I'm handling this, which means um, I'm going to guess who's going to ask me easy questions and say, oh, uh, time for the hard ones. Um, OK, and there are lots of hands, as I thought there might be. So um, let's go Alfred first. Yeah. yeah my question is about, um, I was wondering if you think people can be dishonest to themselves, that someone might keep telling themselves they're happy, but all their friends can see that they're clearly not happy. Yeah. You might say to them, look, you're lying to yourself, or you're yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, let me, let me ask you first. Don't, what do you think? Yes. yes, I think so too, right? Uh, so, and it's not just um, can you lie to yourself, uh, it's can you be dishonest, the way you word it was dishonest, so like a, vi a vicious kind of attitude towards oneself. And the, I would say yes too. And I, there's a further question, does my account accommodate that, right? And I have not um, explored that uh, in, in much detail. It seems like I would need, it, it, it better turn out that way. Um, on, a, on a quick um, pass, seems like I can intentionally distort the facts that I'm telling myself, right? So I think I could work out the parameters of my view in such a way that it could apply to oneself as well. But you, you're, you're uh, uh, encouraging me to make sure that it applies to myself as well, right? Um, and are you initially skeptical doesn't? Or just wanting me to make sure I pay attention to that? Just to make sure you pay attention. I was thinking there might be two different ways you might be dishonest to yourself, or that might be going on there. One you might say is you said you're distorting the facts to yourself. Uh -huh. Or the other, something else that people might be saying there maybe isn't a case of dishonesty is that people are really bad at forming beliefs. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you maybe could divide the case yeah. that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. The same case might not be dishonest. Yeah, exactly. Like That's what I was going to say. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Angela, yeah. Okay, so this is my question, too, and I just want to follow up on it. Yeah. But I'm not sure you can accommodate it. Okay. Um, here's why. Um, suppose I intentionally, some people exaggerate a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and a lot of people know they're exaggerating, right? Um, suppose I do that a lot. Mm -hmm. It can easily become the case that I cease to know that I'm exaggerating. So now mm -hmm. I just see reality in that exaggerated way. And so now it is not the case that I intentionally distort the facts. I see the facts that way. Ah. And so then it looks like by being dishonest on your account, I become honest on your <coughs> account. Right? Because when it becomes habitual, now I fit. Now I'm good. Um, so let me take this, this over for a second. Uh, so initially, I might intentionally distort the facts. Um, but then I, so I exaggerate a lot, and I come to see myself a certain way. Um, 
where these are the facts, and I'm not, there's no intentional distorting of the facts anymore. I brought myself to a point where um, these are the facts. So at that point, uh, I might be okay with saying I'm, okay. It would, so it would be impl certainly leading up to that point, I was being dishonest with respect to myself, and I can account for that. Um, do you also want to say that having gotten to that point, I'm still being dishonest? About myself, or I, one move would be to make uh, be the move to make. Uh, I've, I've now entered into the realm of another vice. Well, it seems to me that I mean, what, what's driving my worry, and I'm not even sure if you have to stick at the self deception, it could be deceiving other people hmm. as well. But it seems to me a mark of having the, the vice, a vice, yeah. is <clears throat> often you don't know that you have the vice or that you, you think that you're acting well, right? And it seems on your account, I'm not vicious, I'm still being honest as long as. Um, I don't know that I'm intent that I'm distorting, right? The intention has to be there, and I think that if I'm a habitual distorter, I think that person is dishonest. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, so I'm, if I'm doing this a lot, but I don't know that I'm doing it. If I get to the point yeah, where yeah, I no yeah, longer yeah. know that I'm distorting, uh -huh. like I get the cases that you want yeah. to accommodate, yeah, I really yeah, yeah, buy on yeah. that. But this is a case where somebody got to be a habitual disorder yeah. by, by deliberately disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I get to the point where I think um, this is actually true. So let's take it lying, right? Uh, let's focus on it. So now I'm saying things to people which I, all of a sudden I believe are true. So I'm no longer saying things to them which I believe are false, but I'm trying to distort the facts uh, in their minds. I'm getting to the point where I actually believe these things to be true. Uh, then it seems to me that's no longer a case of of dishonesty. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, I have to confess I've not thought about this at all. So, um, so I, I, I feel the force of the worry if it is going to be the case that it's still an instance of dishonesty. <clears throat> My initial temptation is to deny that it is isn't a case of dishonesty once you succeed to getting that, to that point. But I, I must confess I've not thought about that at all. So that's a real good challenge. Um, Sorry. I guess I could look at the video later, but still I want to write down my thoughts while I have them. Okay, great. Good. Okay, wow. Where do we go next? Um, uh, okay, go for it. Yeah, Katie. Um, this is actually kind of a follow-up, because I was wondering if you might want to add and you know what you just said, maybe you don't. But if you wanted to add to kind of the list of the scope of honesty and dishonesty, uh -huh. I was thinking about your flat earther example, mm -hmm. and I think that sometimes you have an impulse to say to someone who adopts a position like that that they're being dishonest, um, somehow informing the belief and committing themselves uh -huh. to belief that you think okay. you have the resources uh -huh. to, to apply yourself mm -hmm. and see truth here. Mm -hmm. At some point, you've chosen not sure on those Good. resources, so even though you have a belief now, so it's not a lie, yeah, yeah, yeah. there is some form of dishonesty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good. I, I, I agree with that, and I would want to uh, go intellectual versus moral here. Um, uh, okay. So that might be a failure of intellectual honesty, yeah, right. um, but not necessarily a failure of moral honesty uh, at that point, at an early stage. And then later on, uh, maybe a failure of moral honesty or not, depending upon what that person does with those facts as she believes them to be. Um, that's the initial move I want to make. And so, Another question for me at this point is, well, what, it, what about intellectual honesty? Uh, is this meant to be an account here of honesty writ large? Is it just meant to be an account of moral honesty? And it's the latter. Uh, interesting, though, to think about, are there pieces that could be carried over into accounts of intellectual honesty? And I have not done that work of thinking about that, um, so I won't need to. Thank you. OK, uh, where do we go next? Uh, Heidi. And maybe an easier question. All right, thank you. Uh, so yeah, those you, are hard ones. you want to exclude all self-interested, motivating reasons. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and I think I heard toward the end that Aristotle might be on board here. So I take pursuit of eudaimonia to not count as a self-interested, motivating uh, reason. Where do we draw the line? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so 
I guess it depends on what we mean by pursuit of eudaimonia. So is it pursuit of eudaimonia as such, or is it pursuit of my own eudaimonia? So pursuit of my own flourishing, or the pursuit of the flourishing of members of the species in general, or of human beings as such, uh, that's going to make a big difference. So if it's just a pursuit of my own flourishing, that's self-interested, uh, and be disqualifying. Um, but the other would not. Does that, does that make sense? So then we get into debates about what Aristotle's own view is, and if he's ultimate egoist, and we, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I mean, that's a, that's a well-worn path, right? Uh, I do have egoist worries about Aristotle himself. Um, and if it turns out those worries are justified, then maybe Aristotle's uh, own position doesn't allow for honesty as I'm understanding it here. Um, of course, he had a very weird position about honesty in the first place, too. So uh, but that's what I would say. Yeah. OK. Um, you're, I think we're going to a little bit of time, right? Um, so, uh, yes, please. Um, my father somehow relates to the point that the proposal is too passive. And I yeah. wondered yeah. whether defining um, a virtue of honesty by the absence of an action of dishonesty. Mm -hmm. or yeah. How they're framed. Um, would, your, would your example still um, be, um, or can it be used with sentences framed that really meet the point of honesty, or um, to give an example, you wouldn't define the virtue of compassion by the absence of beating other persons. Yeah, yeah, good, 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 good. So I don't know if anyone could hear, but the, the point was, is this account too passive? Uh, since it's phrased negatively, um, does it uh, thereby um, not give us enough an account of what an honest person is possibly supposed to be doing in the world? Just like with respect to compassion, we wouldn't want to understand compassion negatively as not doing certain things. Um, so I uh, am of two minds about this, but uh, in another section of the, of the, the, the book, I do provide a, a way to go if you are worried about the two passive. So I provide a, a whole different account which builds in some more active conditions into it. Uh, so I do that for those who are moved in that direction. I say I'm two minds because I'm conflicted myself as to whether uh, what the truth of the matter is here. So here's an uh, example that I've thought about a little bit. Um, someone else has some badly mistaken beliefs uh, or has been lied to. Uh, and you know this about them, right? Uh, and the question is, as an honest person, are you expected to intervene in some way and try and communicate the truth to that person about how they've been lied to or uh, some of the erroneous beliefs that they've formed? Uh, and I, there's a general moral question, are you expected to do that? But then there's a specific question here, qua honest person, are you expected to do that? And I'm not convinced yet that qua honest person, you are expected to do that. Maybe qua compassionate person or qua some other virtue, uh, you would uh, courageous person, um, intellectually virtuous person in some way. But qua honest person, I'm still not convinced there. So I personally don't know what to say, but I'm, I'm leaning still towards the passive side of things. But if you want to go more active, I've got an alternative for you. So yeah. <laughs> OK, um, uh, lots of hands. Uh, this is the, okay. I'm trying to think of people who haven't had a chance, at least in the sessions I've been at, uh, to ask questions. Yeah. Um, so what, uh, my main question turned into a kind of has transformed. So I wondered why you're resisting so strongly building in a care for truth into what a genuinely moral, morally honest person is like. Um, that, so that seems like that would just be part of being honest versus caring for the truth. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this, my response here is going to be similar to my response here. Uh, maybe if, in an account of intellectual honesty. Uh, but I don't see why that has, has to be part of an account of moral honesty. Um, Just because that's what honesty means. I mean, that's what, so these different questions seem to be sort of pushing that. Honest is to care for the truth. Yeah. Um, so, so take someone who um, never cheats. Uh, it's not clear to me that that person, uh, that care for the truth is really central to what's going on in the person who never cheats. Uh, similarly, with the person who never steals. Uh, so, so maybe uh, with respect to parts of the moral virtue of honesty, yes, to the lying part, 
and the not lying part, uh, but as a necessary condition or a common feature that covers all the range of cases that fall under the heading of moral honesty, uh, I'm not convinced yet, okay? Um, so compatible with everything I said, uh, we, could, we could add it if we wanted to, but I'm uh, only seeing it as applying in certain cases and not all cases. If that makes sense. Um, yes? Uh, I'm going to make okay. this be the last one. Ah. I'm going to have the last okay. one because we do have to get to the pictures. So it seems like I'm getting to be the bad this relates to the carefully truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's to do with how foundation is cheating and probably seeing. So I think there might be more than one device involved in being somebody cheats. So oh, one will be being dishonest, you're willing to deceive others about what you owe. And the other is not caring very much for justice. But they know that the rules of the situation are going into that. Sorry, who's what's up? This is about justice, so not caring about fairness. So it's something that's coming to you again. Back up, back up, back up. They're willing to deceive others about whether they follow the rules. And they're not just because they're willing to do an unfair thing to gain an advantage over others for not the right reasons. And again, you might see the same thing in stealing. Someone who steals is both willing to deceive others about the truth of the matter, which is that this is someone else's property. Uh -huh. So that might be a justice question, it might not depend on the background conception of the right Okay, okay. And so that would be why care for a truth that you still get in, even though the who cheat are also dishonest. It's because only part of what's wrong with the cheaters is that they're dishonest. They're also not just. Ah. Uh -huh. So the dishonest part, that has to do with care for truth. The justice part need not, but that falls under the purview of some other uh, virtue. And so then even those cases, huh? Yeah, and that means the opposite of being a cheat shouldn't be proper obedience in your opposition. It should be about deception. So, so yeah. the, the corresponding virtue is not proper obedience, which would be proper obedience of, I think, justice, actually, would be better. And it's not deceiving others. Ah, okay. Now that sounds, that sounds promising to me. Uh, and it counts for this intuition. Um, hmm. I think uh, you all have helped me <laughs> revise this. Um, Initially, I, I liked the, the proposal, so uh, I'm going to have to go back and think about it. And I'm, I mean that honestly. I'm not, there's not a, 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 a way to dodge the question by saying, oh, yeah, let me think about it. No, uh, initially, that seems attractive. So, yeah, um, great. I appreciate it. So thank you all for helping me out. Be around, of course. <laughs>